Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I am Jen Hornjeff. I'm the founder and CEO of Savvy Cooperative. And Savvy, we're also proud partners with the Conference Forum. They do such a tremendous job with all of their meetings. And I know trying to make this virtual meeting as interactive and vibrant as possible. And so happy to be able to close out day one here. And I myself am a patient, so I care so much about having these conversations and really thinking about how can we shake things up in the industry, really for the benefit of patients. Yes, there's so many different stakeholders that are hopefully benefiting as well, and that we are engaging in this process, but let's keep our eye on the prize and always be thinking about how can we make sure that anything that we're doing is going to be for the benefit of patients and caregivers. So like I said, I am founder and CEO here at Savvy Cooperative. And the exciting thing about this particular presentation and panel discussion is I get to showcase some cool work that we've been doing with our, our friends over at AstraZeneca. Scott is over here to my little box there, which is why I'm awkwardly doing this over there. Um, and AstraZeneca has been doing some really great work to be rethinking kind of how they are trying to support patients, especially in the new world of decentralized trials. I shouldn't even say that it's that new because we know that both patients have been pressing for this and certain companies have been pressing for this. And finally, you know, everybody is waking up to the fact that this is the new normal and that we're going to be really then leaning into these new sort of decentralized and or hybrid models for really supporting patients throughout trials. Savvy had the opportunity to work with AstraZeneca, who had the opportunity to work with patients to be able to create a dialogue over how we can sort of co-create a better design and support system. And so that's really kind of what this particular session is going to really home in on is digging into an actual case study about how this can be done to work collaboratively with patients so that we can actually accelerate making these processes better. So I'm going to pause here before I dig in with our two esteemed uh, speakers. Scott, who's going to be sharing a little bit about his background at AstraZeneca, and Dominic, who is also a fantastic patient who's been using his voice in a variety of ways to help amplify how we can be co-designing with patients. So Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you first for a little introduction and then kick it off with Dominic to give a little bit more perspective from the patient side. So Scott, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jen. Um, a little background. Yeah, for sure. So hi, everybody. My name is Scott Saunders. Uh, I work at AstraZeneca. Um, my official title, I think, at AstraZeneca is Product Discovery Lead. Um, but essentially, what I do is uh, a whole lot of user experience research. Um, I work not only with on the patient side of things, but but also with a number of, of health healthcare professionals like uh, you know, principal investigators and, and study coordinators and, and, and things like that. Um, but most specifically, um, for the last, uh, I don't know, 15 to 16 months, I've been working on one of our digital applications um, that we're creating. Um, it is both patient facing as well as healthcare professional facing. But the, uh, the, the, the research that we conducted with Savvy and with Dominic and with several patients uh, was patient centric. And we were trying to uh, much better understand patient perspective uh, around a feature and functionality within our application called Home Supply, where we would be um, actually providing uh, trial supplies, trial medication uh, to patients directly uh, to their home so that they wouldn't have to travel, uh, whether that would be to an office or a, a pharmacy to go get that. And so my background, I've been conducting research in some form or fashion for the past 15 plus years and uh, really specializing in user experience over the last eight I've uh, been working at AstraZeneca now for about a year and a half, and when I found Jen and Savvy, I was exceptionally happy because uh, when I got onboarded to our product, um, it was evident that we needed to be conducting a whole lot more research directly with patients, and uh, a lot of kudos, a lot of, a lot of hats off to, to Jen and their team to, uh, to help provide um, us that immediate access. So that's a little bit about my background, and uh, yeah, excited to talk to everybody. Awesome. Well, thanks, Scott. But truly, the heroes of this story are the patients that you're able to connect with. And Dominic was one of said patients who provided not only awesome feedback for that, but I know, Dominic, you've been using your voice in a variety of different ways and mediums uh, to be able to really kind of 
help people understand what that patient perspective is. So turn it to you for a little bit of background, and then we'll dig into a little bit more about exactly what Scott is talking about with this particular project. Sure, yeah. Um, thanks for having me. I appreciate being here and being able to speak and um, yeah, share the experience. Um, so my name is Dominic Quagliazzi. I'm a visual artist and performance artist um, from Los Angeles, now Massachusetts. Um, I am also a patient. I have cystic fibrosis. And in 2015, I had a double lung transplant at Stanford University. And since my transplant, I have been doing well, but I've also developed uh, diabetes, uh, hypothyroidism, and some other issues. So what I do is I make artwork uh, about the lived patient experience through cystic fibrosis, uh, lung transplantation, and I share those works uh, as like a, a visual guide for medical students, um, doctors, nurses in the medical environment. So for, for example, um, I've shown at the UCLA School of Medicine, uh, the Geffen School of Medicine, the um, School of Medicine at USC, University of Southern California, and spoke, uh, have spoken at conferences such as the Nexus Summit in Minnesota a few different times as a keynote uh, speaker as patient as a patient, and also sat in on many of their demonstrations and seminars to give feedback from the patient perspective. And um, I've also worked with children with chronic pain through art workshops as part of um, Creative Healing for Youth in Pain. It's an organization out of Los Angeles where we use scientific clinical neurotherapy and uh, I don't want to say art therapy because I don't necessarily do art therapy, but actually art in action um, to, so we've designed summer camps and workshops throughout the year for the past two years to meet with those. Um, uh, they're basically 12 to 20 year old. Uh, and yeah, so I've, and I've also mentored other people on the list for lung transplantation because it's a very long and complicated process and it's it's a very emotional roller coaster so to have somebody there guiding you and helping you and uh being there is is important as i had for my for my journey when i was on the transplant list so that's a little bit about me um uh yeah so thanks for having me yeah no the the pleasure is all of ours um and you have given such great insights and i can't wait to dig into that but i would be remiss if i do not call out the fact that dominic is the one who designed my beautiful piece of artwork back here. Um, this is its debut of being shown. So welcome to you know the kickoff of this little art gallery we have yeah. back here. But I really appreciate it. Um, he does amazing work. And Dominic, could you explain a little bit about what, you, what you're wearing today? Yeah, sure. So in 2019, I had been doing these conferences, these patient conferences, well, medical conferences as a patient, and I wanted to make a piece that kind of represents this transition or actually a, like a representation of the two worlds that patients live in, like the real world, you know, the, the, the working world, the, the professional world, and this patient world where you kind of, as somebody with cystic fibrosis, I was always ripped out of my daily life for two weeks at a time for IV antibiotic treatment. And then the transplant, I was, you know, I had to uproot my life for three months to live up at Stanford and whatever. So I made a suit out of the hospital gowns that I had collected during one admission that I ended up was it was in a coma. And I worked with a, um, a clothing designer in Los Angeles, a friend of mine, and we designed this suit that I wear. And um, it was actually funny because shortly after I wore this suit and kind of debuted the suit at this art event in Los Angeles, I read this NBC article about Jen wearing the full gown at a conference. And I was like, well, I could have spared the effort and just wore the full <laughs> gown, but. <laughs> I didn't pay for any so, designers. Exactly, so right. Yours is way cooler. And what you all don't know is that the, the lettering here actually 
the hospital gowns. And so it is the hospital we're, gowns. Yeah. We're tying it all together. So. Well, thank you for that. Um, the introductions there. Obviously, you can all tell why this is going to be an awesome conversation because we're going to talk specifically about design and how we can design for patients, but let's not just design for them, let's design with them. And so Scott gave a little bit of an introduction about the fact that they were trying to design this new application to help support patients during a clinical trial and wanted to get some patient feedback. And we actually did two rounds of this. Scott and Dominic were part of both. And we facilitated it over here at Savvy. And, and Scott and his team got to kind of listen in and see what the patients were saying, showed them some actual designs that the patients gave feedback on. Then Scott and team were able to make some changes and then came back and showed the patients again to say, did we get it right? Um, what else are we missing? What else do we need to be thinking about? Do we make it better, worse? Let's really dig into that. And then we're able to make some changes. And I think, you know, thematically, there were a few things that kind of came out of this that we'll kind of dig in here. Some of those things were about the language and the terminology that was being used, as well as even some of the designs and the presentation and then also the order with which information was shared and did it make sense? So those are some of the things that we'll kind of unpack here and Scott will be able to share kind of what, what they were thinking and then Dominic can share what you know he and other patients were thinking as well. So let's kind of dig into this. And I want this to be an interactive conversation because we are a small group here. So please put your questions in the chat, but also don't be afraid to come off a video and we'll ask some questions and we'll dig in. Let's make this more of a, a workshop. So to start, Scott, tell us about sort of the design process. You already mentioned like you started working on this and you said, hey, maybe we should get some patient perspective. Why was that? What were you already seeing? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, to, to give a little bit of an overview, we're, I, I worked specifically on a product called Unify, um, which is based um, essentially around giving um, a whole lot of information as well as access to patients um, going through a clinical trial. Um, and, you know, we were pretty heads down sort of focused on a number of different elements and, and aspects of Unify that we're continuing to, uh, to build out and to uh, actually test out with, with patients um, as well. And this home supply feature kind of came out of the blue. We, we knew some people uh, elsewhere within AstraZeneca, it's a big, com uh, big company, were, were kind of ideating on, on what this could look like. Uh, but I would say that um, we weren't maybe prepared for it to, to land directly on our roadmap as, as quickly as it did. Um, and so we we had to like really quickly work and, and ideate uh, internally to try to figure out, okay, how are we gonna implement this particular feature within Unify, like the, the larger ecosystem of, of Unify. Um, and it became really, uh, uh, it wasn't even so much that, that we needed to, to test home supply. We need to test everything that goes into uh, to, to Unify with patients. Um, but it was just one of those things that came up really quickly. And we were like, Jen, we need help. We need, we need direct access with, with patients. Um, and so, it, you know, I, I wouldn't say that there was anything specific around um, home supply specifically that needed to be tested, everything needs to be tested with patients. Um, because as we learned uh, drastically, our, our first version of home supply within Unify uh, failed pretty hard. Um, and uh, that's actually not a bad thing. I mean, I think that failure is, is, is a part of digital design and it um, should be a part of, of every team that, that's working and creating something digitally, particularly around patients and, and this population. Um, you, you should be expecting to fail, but you, you need to be iterative and work really collaborative with patients and, and get their direct input. So it's not surprising that this failed, um, particularly with how quickly we had to, to move. Um, but yeah, our first round of testing uh, was, it was pretty brutal in spots. Uh, so, but that's okay. And let's talk about some of that. Um, so you had already mentioned that this is supposed to support patients getting deliveries at home. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we even learned in, in the testing of this was to sort of set the stage for patients. And so Dominic, in, in the conversation that I had specifically with you was around even at what point is this app being deployed? Has the patient already had a visit in a clinic or yeah. is this the first time they're ever seeing anything like this? And when we clarified that this is the first time they're ever gonna see it. They're, th this yeah. is not gonna be deployed in a clinic where you've already had an in-person visit. It's like, here's the app here you go, let's make sure that we're getting the information that you need there. So Dominic, how did that 
change your perspective of what kind of information or how things were being even conveyed, knowing that there was no in-person visit prior to. Yeah. That. Yeah. That was like, that was when we were speaking very, very um, upfront about the, the, the use of the app. And I, I kind of scrolled through that very first page and that's why I asked that, I asked that question. And I, I, I wanted to know that because when I was reading the first, I guess it would be the, the home page or the landing page or whatever the, of the app. A lot of the uh, prompts kind of made me feel like I had, had already met with a clinician or gotten background briefing about what the study was or knew what, you know, I, I had some information going in. And then when you said that this is kind of like you're getting this cold from the beginning at this point, I was like, ah, this is, this is scary as a patient this would be scary because i it was i wasn't being briefed on you know what i needed to do what i needed to know what was going to affect me personally um both in terms of when i'm getting the medications and what the medications could do to me or for me and then any kind of outcomes i'm, I'm expected to look for whatever the case may be may be and even to the point where it was talking about like you know, I think the second page was talking about the shipment you're receiving and questions around that. So, um, so yeah, so when we, when, when I realized that it was the start of the app was actually the start of the, the medical interaction, I said, we got to back it up a little bit, bring in some kind of conversational language, like say like, Hey, how are you? You know, th this is a, a new study and kind of go through some of the steps of what you're going to be expecting as the patient to kind of ease some of that anxiety you might have, and then also better prepare for when, um, when, when things, you know, when the medications come, what you need to look for and things like that. Yeah, I appreciate you kind of bringing that up because I remember that was something was like, a, oh, maybe we need to even revamp how we're communicating, like not just the fact that we need to catch them up to speed with what's going to happen, but like you just mentioned that conversational tone, because mm -hmm. yeah, patients are not just robots that just need information. People want to ingest said information in a different kind of way. And to also sort of know that you're, you're there and being supportive. I'm curious, Scott, as you were hearing this information and as your team was hearing this, how did they feel about sort of the stuff that could be seen as sort of the, you know, fluffy aspect of it. It's like, oh, well, we gave them the information that they needed. Were they responsive to the idea that there's perhaps a different way people want to be communicated with? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, a, a few a few elements to that. So the first is, and, and one of the really beautiful things, uh, you know, about actually testing with patients in an environment like this is, um, you know, when you're designing something and, and you're creating it, it's really, really easy to just get kind of locked in your own little universe. And, and you don't realize the way that, that your tone might be coming off in, in the way that you're communicating with, you know, directly with the patient or, or whoever the user of, of your application might be. And so one of the, the greatest things about testing like this, particularly with patients, is um, particularly the, the first round of testing, you, you're going to get a, a pretty strong reaction to that if, if you're not landing with the right tone and, and, and the right way that, that you're surfacing some of the content to them. So uh, yes, it, it was really, really awesome to, to be able to, to sit through those sessions and, and hear the way that um, the, the, the actual tone, um, it just wasn't conversational enough. It wasn't um, friendly enough to, to be quite honestly, I, I think it was a little bit probably cold and, and icy. And I think that that was partially um, in a, a direct sort of um, response to how quickly we were, we were creating some of these things and, and how quickly we were getting that in front of patients. Um, but one of the really cool aspects of, of the way that we, we did this um, study was uh, you know, Jen and Dominic would actually be going through the prototype uh, and we used a, a, a software called Lookback so that we could actually see Dominic actually interacting with his with the device, um, the, the, the prototype actually on his phone. And while he was doing that, anytime he made a comment um, or, or had an issue with whether it was the, the you know, the actual process that, that we, we were, um, you know, creating from a design perspective or the actual content, uh, I was in the back end in our design tool in Figma, which is, is the design tool that, that we actually use. 
And I was adding comments uh, for, for every patient that was going through it, direct feedback into our designs, um, which then our team would have uh, workshops uh, sort of on a, on a daily basis, going through that feedback and trying to, uh, to adjust the language as well as just uh, adjust the entire, entire process. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, there's a lot of elements from digital design that, that you should never look at in an isolated uh, you know, scenario. And so when we were creating this digital experience, we also needed to communicate with our larger uh, team that there was gonna be uh, crafting the more holistic experience. So we were working with a lot of this information that, that Dominic, whenever he was having pain points or uh, articulating areas of improvement that were needed, uh, sometimes they weren't even specific to the actual digital experience. It was maybe uh, specific to, to something outside, like uh, if, if we could provide maybe contextual videos or onboarding experiences and so uh, it's really important for us to use that information that he was giving us and uh, transition it not even in, in the digital realm. So, uh, yeah, it was a really, really fun experience on my end. And I appreciate you even just mentioning that because I think it segues into us thinking about sort of what other modalities do people want to learn from and just how else do people, you know, take in information. So one of those things being something like a video or imagery. And I remember it was the second iteration after some revisions had been made that we sort of displayed kind of like the video window with the little yeah. play symbol and people would be like, oh, so can I press play? I'm like, not yet, because there's no <laughs> video there. And we would ask them, what do you want to see in a video if there was sort mm -hmm. of an onboarding video so that they could use their imagination and say, I would expect it to tell me X, Y, and Z. And part of that was also building off of the dearth of imagery in certain other places where they wanted something to show. And so Dominic, especially as an artist, um, you had a lot of different ideas of what this could be, not only from, you know, if there was an image that you wanted to see that wasn't there, but also some confusion around certain images that were there that you expected different yeah, interactions with. Sure. So I'm curious if you can talk about that. Yeah, like some of the some of the design on the on the pages were, uh, you know, they were, they looked like they should be links or something like that, like a, uh, like a little plus sign that was just like, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody by calling it clip art, but it was just like a little, you know, like the, the red cross sign or something. And to me, I kept on wanting to click on that, but it, that was just a background design. And um, another thing, there was like a, you know, it was like step two or three, when you receive your package, there'll be a thermometer in there to test to see if the medication has arrived safely. And the thermometer issue, it, it, I was like, I, is that thermometer? Or I think Jen was like, what is, what do you think that is? And I was like, uh, I, a pregnancy test, a matchbook. I couldn't, I didn't know. So she's like, that's a, that's an image of a thermometer trying to illustrate to you that you should check the thermometer and make sure it's of a certain temperature to make sure your, you know, your medications were, were safe in the, in the shipping. And so these, it was these little things or maybe big things that we were kind of talking about. And yeah. as you're using something in your, on your handheld device or on your computer, what, what you're looking for. So these are, aren't necessarily patient things, but they're just like visual uh, literacy things where you're just like, okay, like I, I've, you know, we've been in the digital world for a long time now. So like these things kind of represent a way of acting to, to the machine or at the machine. And so we cleared up some of those issues and, and then the videos too. I, I thought that was in the second iteration, I believe. And I thought that was a, a good improvement, but still kind of working on what they could say and how they could say what they needed to say as in terms of tutorials and things like that. And we talked about some people like bullet points to, to learn and some people like uh, illustrations and some people like full on tutorial videos. So how do you capture everyone's, you know, um, learning abilities in one small little app or not, not to diminish your work it's not a small little app but you know yeah. what i mean like and the handheld device how can you uh, accommodate for everyone's learning uh, abilities so they can have the same playing field in terms of 
uh, being in the same study as well, you know? So these are the questions that we were talking about and yeah. Yeah, and it makes me think too, even back to before we did this particular project, there was actually earlier work that was done before the patients were shown like an actual prototype to play with. And that work was sort of setting the stage for this to give them the idea of, okay, if medications were delivered straight to your home, what would, how would you feel about that? What would you need? What kind of things would you want? How would you want to be communicated with? So this was sort of leading up to that. And there was also conversations around, would people want an app? And, you know, luckily we certainly have patients that have different, you know, levels of vision loss or other things to be really cognizant of as well, that we're sort of calling some of these things out either about font size, font colors, you know, the need to also be able to do it, not on an app, but on a desktop or things like this. So I think there was a lot of great sort of dialogue about that, um, that hopefully the, the Unify home supply teams could sort of take back and think about. I want to talk about this thermometer aspect because it, I feel like is one of my most proud moments to be a part of this thermometer aspect of this project. So Scott, talk to us about what is this and why am I so happy to talk about this? Yeah, the, uh, the ever infamous uh, temperature logger that, that uh, needed to be a part of this. So um, when I first started working with the, the kind of separate team within AstraZeneca that, that was um, kind of working on the, the genesis of what home supply would be, one of the elements that they um, initially brought to us that I, I raised as a red flag too, um, they were like, okay, well, there's going to be a, a, a temperature uh, logger that's going to be included in, in the medication, and we need the, uh, the, the patients to turn off the, the, the temperature logger and interact with it and um, just you know answer like a question or two uh, about the temperature logger once they're receiving their medication. And I was like, well, that sounds really complex, really cumbersome, and like a really bad experience. Uh, but I couldn't, I didn't win the battle uh, before we did the first round of testing. And even when we were going through the walkthrough with Jen, she was like, uh, what is this temperature logger? I was like, I don't know. We're, let's see what patients say. Uh, I mean, we, we kind of knew it was going to bomb, right? Uh, but yeah, it, and it did. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, just universally panned. P patients didn't understand it. It was really exceptionally confusing. Um, we didn't create AstraZeneca, did, we, we didn't create the, the temperature logger. We were partnering with a company that I, I won't say their name on, on the, the temperature logger, but it was really confusing the way that it was set up. Um, there needed to be a lot of, a, a lot of context that, that surrounded it that, that wasn't available within the app. We didn't put it in the app initially. Uh, it, that probably would have helped, but even so it was really a burden. It was it was something that, that we were asking the patient to do that uh, was not, it was just not a good situation. Um, and so we tested it and um, yeah, it, uh, Jen, I don't know if you want to add anything to it or, or, or Dominic, but um, it tested really poorly in the first round. Yes, it tested poorly. I mean, it was very confusing. It was like, click the, click the red button to stop. But so many patients were like, but I'm, this is the first time I'm interacting with it. Don't I hit the green button to start? And so like just counterintuitive for many people, but okay. So it was confusing. All the patients said, what is this? I don't understand. I need more background. But the fact is not only was it confusing in the app, but it actually made the patient do something physically that, that just was a little bit cumbersome. And so how did you all respond to that information? What happened next? Well, um, so I was able to push really strongly uh, internally and say, look, this thing is going to be a major problem and we need to exclude it from uh, the, what we're asking the patient to, uh, to interact with. And to AstraZeneca's exceptional credit, um, we took the feedback and we completely removed the temperature logger from being something that the patient directly had to interact with. Uh, there's a pretty significant cost uh, for us to, to actually do that. Um, but it's going to, it's going to transition and translate into a, an experience where this is going on in the background. Um, we're still going to educate patients that this is something that's happening um, just to let them know that, that their doctor is, is making sure that the, there was no temperature uh, oscillation um, during the transportation of the, the, the medication over to the patient. Um, but the patient doesn't have the burden of actually having to interact with a, a foreign device as well as um, you know, sort of translate any kind of questions around it uh, with, within the experience. And so we were able to remove it. And um, we were only able to do that with uh, the, the direct 
um, kind of communication that we had from patients. And I, I, I just want to interject here. I, I was saying, I don't know if other patients said similar themes, but I was saying uh, in terms of this temperature device, once the patient feels like they did something wrong or something is an error, the whole trial will be suspect in their mind for the rest of the time. You can never regain that confidence if, you, if you've lost it as a patient because you're putting things into your body and you're, you're just like, okay, now what's like, you just keep on reiterating and that puts a patient on edge so, so significantly that I, I don't know if you can get that trust back for that particular study. So yeah, kudos to, to getting rid of that and, you know, making it a, 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 an easier transition for, for the patients. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that, especially in the context which you already mentioned, that if this is the first time people are sort of like interacting with the trial, to be like, whoa, here's this thing that I'm going to potentially muck up before then putting something into my body, really important to call out. So I'm going to open it up here for questions. I hope we can start to have a dialogue. I, I know many of you here, so... I know that you have many thoughts and are going to say fabulous things. Um, but Dominic, to give you sort of the last word here before we do that, you know, I'm curious how you sort of see the future of developing these innovations and if you are surprised about any of the changes that you saw because of, you know, your knowledge and interactions with yeah. pharma companies or like, how do you view this? Is this a positive experience and you don't need to be just you know, complimentary sure. here. Like what should the, the folks listening in be thinking about as they might yeah. want to go and do similar projects themselves? No, I, 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 ha I had a positive experience in, just in general because Jen and Scott are so amazing. Uh, no, they, they paid me off camera to say that. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think mobile, uh, mobile apps and, um, you, you know, moving forward, especially with, um, things like COVID, it, it, you know, kind of bringing these new uh, needs, or they're not new needs, bringing the needs we've had for a long time to light, uh, or to more urgency, I should say. Um, as, as someone who has had a lot of my life taken by hospital appointment, doctor's appointments, you know, needing to commute, drive to clinic appointments, waiting in waiting rooms, and blah, 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 whatever. Um, the more things that can be put into my hands, the better. So I'm all for trials via apps. I'm all for, um, you know, teleconferencing for, you know, uh, telemedicine, I should say. Uh, I'm all for that. And, and I think that's why this is a, such an important conversation because I think a lot of patients uh, are like me where they want to have more freedom because the chronic illnesses that we have or acute illnesses in a lot of people's cases as well, take away a lot of that freedom. So getting time as a patient, getting time back is significantly important. And for me as a transplant recipient, the thing that I got back most, obviously extension of life, but not having to do 45 minute to an hour and a half treatments a day for cystic fibrosis, airway clearance, I got all that time back and, uh, you know, I, so I can do more things throughout my daily life. Um, so yeah, I, I'm all for, you know, except what I, I should say, we should have a separate meeting about, um, these, uh, what are they called? The, the patient, sorry. So sometimes I get like brain fog from prograph, um, you know, the, 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 my, the, my health apps, that keep all your, like your charts and your results. Those things are kind of a nightmare at this point in time. <laughs> so let's try to work on those next. Sounds good. Yes. Um, no shortage of problems to solve, but with yeah. fabulous people like you, Dominic, who weigh in and share your experience yeah. and people like Scott and those else of you on the line that I know are truly committed to this work as well. That's how we get there. And so yeah. really, really humbled by you both sharing your experiences with this particular project. And with that, I want to open it up to other folks on the line here to ask, ask them your questions, share your experience, and let's see how we can sort of use this brain trust to think through some of these things. Anyone have a question or comment? Feel free to just pipe in. I think that, you know, brings up a great point about just sort of approaching it with humility that 
healthcare is such a multi-stakeholder, complex ecosystem that no one party is going to hold all the information to get it right, that we have mm -hmm. to sort of collaborate to do it. So I think, you know, with the advent of so many new apps and all the tech companies coming into healthcare, we need to keep that sort of innovative mindset that they have, but at the same time say, mm, let's, you know, make sure that we understand who we're talking about and get them engaged here. Thanks for sharing that, Richie. Yeah, I think having patients on design teams is very important too. And I think, I don't want to generalize, but I would assume some companies do not see the do not see the outside value of patients. And my, what I mean by that is they see them as patients and they only have that knowledge about patienthood. But yeah. I mean, I know so many chronic, chronically ill artists that have, you know, dozens of years of experience in design and, you know, even uh, user experience and things like that. You can get those people into the design teams. And I think, you know. Yeah. Well, so there, and there's multiple ways to do that too, Dominic. So, um, I mean, one of the things that we're doing at AstraZeneca, and I'm sure that uh, other pharmaceutical companies are doing this as well, but, um, you know, you hear about patient collaboration. Um, and sometimes I think it, it is in quotes because people aren't doing it. Um, but we just like patient centered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it makes me crazy. Um, we've really embraced it. Uh, we, we have a, uh, um, a, a patient group that we work with, uh, we, we meet with them every six weeks. Uh, and we, we just call them collaborative collaboration sessions and they're just part of the team. And we don't come to them with stuff that's like fully baked or fully cooked. It's just like, Hey, let's kick this around for two or three hours. Um, mm -hmm. let's ideate on, on a number of different things that, that we're trying to potentially implement into the, the, the product. And, um, that that's the only way that you can actually create something that's going to be useful and valuable to the patients as, as they're going through um, exceptionally difficult times during their lives. And so uh, I, I'll say this um, with, with at least the product teams that I've been working on at AstraZeneca, we've really tried to, uh, to, to, to put that yeah. uh, front and center. And it's um, every single one, every single time that I, I either watch a session or I'm leading a session with, with patients, I, I, I learn something and I gain a little bit of empathy, which is, is the, the ultimate thing that we're trying to, to capture. Yeah. Great, thank you. I know that I'm being told that it is the, the end of our time here, but I will take sort of the moderator's prerogative here to kind of wrap us up um, and just thank our, our esteemed, not only panelists, but all of you all that I know are doing this work, but Scott for coming to this session and sort of giving so much of, you know, the vulnerability with which you're approaching the work. I just truly respect um, the fact that you are trying to lead this team to see this way as well. I know that it's having such a huge impact. And like I say, this was one of my like shining moments in doing this kind of work. I know it's like a temperature logger, but when you came back and said that that was gone, it was like, oh my gosh, this is like <laughs> in a week, patients made that kind of impact yeah. that's going to help patients, you know, across the globe, across the different trials that you all are working on. It was just so profound and it sounds so simple, but as a patient, it really does make a difference. And so I wanna just thank you again for the work that you're doing to champion this on the inside. We need those champions to keep the work going. And Dominic, I mean, what can I say? You're fantastic and there's nothing to replace a patient's personal experience. And you come at it with such a, a grace to give people the benefit of the doubt, but to, to welcome them in to get this kind of feedback. And I think that that's what the industry also needs to know is that patients want to help. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to improve healthcare more than patients do. And so That's they true. can truly be your partners on this. And so, we also want to get paid for it too. <laughs> yeah, and equitably valuing patients. Yeah. And so this, of mm -hmm. course, is something that savvy champions of to make sure that patients are fairly compensated. Yes. So yes, Dominic was compensated for his time and expertise as he should be. And mm -hmm. I think that's just like, you know, we need to, if we're going to value people, we need to actually value people. It can't just be lip service. Well, with that, I will thank you for closing out this first day of DFARM. Again, thank you to the conference forum for allowing us to have this conversation. I hope having you know sort of a deeper dive into an actual project was helpful, and hopefully we can continue to collaborate and learn from each other going forward. Thank you, everybody. I don't know how we end these Zoom things anymore, but...
I guess we just hit end at some point. They'll kick us off. I know, yeah. fade out into the into black. But thank you, everybody. Um, you know, just really appreciate everyone's interest in this, and hopefully, we will all see you in person at the next D Farm. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks Likewise. for all the work, Scott, as well too. Thank you too. Thank Dom. you.